better late than never, we return to the smoke room for another William update. And at least with this one, we'll finally be up to date with the smoke room. So let's just get straight into it. I just haven't honed in on anything as of yet. I felt a pit in my stomach. What sorts of strange things, William? Todd won't trouble Mrs. Green just for her pies. Her husband's missing. I look back over to the jail cell. I can see the moonlight on those sheets. It's not hard to imagine them rise and fall beneath the fabric. They don't. Should we be talking about this here? He can't hear you, son. But what if he can? He's not anybody no more. Unless there's something inside him that still can. Something that poisoned him. Just like Jack's cave. Just like dirt beneath our feet. This town is cursed. I think William knows that, but he doesn't know how to put it into words. I don't think he's a spiritual man. I've never seen him go to church. Though it's not like I do either, anymore. Just feels disrespectful is all. William looks at me like he knows I'm fibbing. What are you afraid of, Sam? Most of everything. I was brought up a God-fearing man. William crosses his arms and furrows his brow. You're dodging my question. But I'll entertain it. Leviticus 18, colon 22 never held you back from doing what you do. You don't seem like the type who memorizes scripture, Sheriff. You pick up a few time and again. But that ain't important. I don't take you much for a literalist, Sam. You're in between the lines when you want to. I don't think you're afraid of God standing in that corner. From your perspective, surely you could hear us just as well as my office is in front of that corpse. The both of us turned to the sudden loud banging of a hammer. And he could hear us over Todd boarding up my window too. Him being all knowing and all powerful and all. Fair enough. So I'll repeat myself, Sam. What are you afraid of? I've never been much good at blocking things out. Even when I want to. There's uh, some mean and stupid rocks tumbling around my head. Don't call yourself stupid. Only I'm allowed to do that. Says who? That uh, red on your face. He pats me on the cheek. I slap his hand away. What are those rocks spelling out, Sam? I'm just an ordinary sin. Such as? Doubt. William Hems. It's ordinary for men to doubt the existence of God, Sam. I don't think you should be hard on yourself for that. Well, I ain't scared of him being fake. If God ain't real, we just don't exist anymore when we die. And that would be that. I know there are worse things than never waking, for certain. So what's the worst thing you have on your mind? It doesn't seem like he's going to budge on this. I already feel guilty for thinking it, so I might as well say it. Well, I cough and clear my throat. It's the same fear I've always had, really. Ever since I was a boy. I knew if God must be real. I'm starting to stutter with my words. I, I knew I, I'd be scared of the possibility that our tiny animal minds could never begin to process what God really is. The Bible is written by people, so they wouldn't be able to get close neither. And that we never understand the vast and terrible workings that make up his mind, soul and body. And that when he makes us in our mother's womb, and he knows who we'll be and how we'll die. Right at the very start. Well, it don't matter if we're good, we're kind, we're cruel, we're callous. We're all just a meal for him. And through the entirety of our lives, he feasts on everything that we are. Trembling in my lips stops. I rub the sweat from my brow. You can hear me, God. I'm sorry for thinking that. But every time I push the thought away, it always comes back. Christ Almighty! I told you that the thought was wicked. The coyote pinches the bridge of his nose. No, no, I ask. This is what I deserve. 
I just never pinned your brain being that. He waved his paw in a circle in the air. Artistic. That's all. I think I bothered him. Well, that's a mite difficult considering the gunshots, the wounds and the dead boy, but I'll step to it. A bit of rest will do us all some good. You should go back to the hip. I have a faint inkling you wouldn't get a wink of sleep tonight if you stayed. Wouldn't stay not if you paid me. Well, make sure you check in with me tomorrow. We need to put ideas together. You have a lead? Well, this one should be easy. How? Sam. We have a bullet and a firearm. You think a boy's just running around willy-nilly with a loaded gunny port at the store so he could stalk and gun down a target after hours? No, an adult gave him that weapon. Well, who? Either somebody very crafty or somebody very stupid. Uh, though I bet the rest of my left ear it was someone very stupid. What time should I show up tomorrow? Oh, apart from a visit, the coroner perched in a window should be here all day. So that one ever suits you. I'll see what I can do. I opened the door, letting my eyes adjust to the dark road. Seems like nobody's coming. Good. Hey. I turned to William's barking voice behind me. There's one more thing before you go, Sam. Yeah? Lighten up. He shuts the door on me. <laughs> Wish I could, you stubborn bastard. Maybe he stayed calm because he thinks he's won. Because he protected us. Because he thinks he's always one step ahead. If that bullet wasn't clean, it broke Murdoch's skin. If it gets infected, he might die. And I think somebody wanted that bullet in Cliff. I can't be calm about that all. I don't think you should be either, William. Then again, maybe you aren't. I don't know. Maybe next time I should ask what scares you. Who is that there, I wonder? Morning again. Sleep is easier since I told William the truth. But I miss the carefree feelings I used to get. It ain't like life was easy before this business with Jack. But I can't say I feel like the same person. I'm worried about things I used to shrug off. I don't want Nick to think I can't laugh with him like I used to. And I don't want that fox to get sick. Ruminations like that give too much pause for a job all about being present in the act. I don't want this to carry over into that. The sudden knocking makes me flinch beneath the covers. Are you decent, Samuel? Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. She enters the room, closes the door and lets out a huge sigh. Are still in bed? I suppose it can't be helped considering the wild night you had last night. You know about what happened last night? How couldn't I? The mayor and that ghastly principal are putting on airs in my own home. As if nobody in this town has been stabbed, shot or beaten before. I complain about that in front of me of all people. I blink, watching her pace back and forth. I have a mind to tip my glass over the both of them, but my drinks are much too expensive to be wasted like that. I glance to the right, then to the left, breaking eye contact. Ma'am? The doe lets out another long sigh. And my apologies, Sam. You're not used to hearing me prattle. Well, more like it's usually about me. I could, because it's about to be again. They both wish to speak with you. I throw off the covers. Me? What for? I don't even know these people. Most likely to manipulate you and pump you for information. You are an easier target than that rumbling artillery tractor. She's really emphasising the R sounds there. Stories about the sheriff's other deputy have flown the coop. Though sometimes they think you're the real deputy and Mr Bronson is the trainee since you've more muscle. The poor dear... She sighs and shakes her head. Well, it can't be helped. 
For the love of everything, make yourself decent and meet me in the powder room in five minutes. I want these busybodies out of my home. She leaves the room. I grumble and stretch and make my way over to the vanity. I was so tired I never took off my clothes last night. Maybe a bit dingy. I don't see any of Murdoch's blood on me, so that should be fine. I'd have a clean-smelling pine perfume on my wrists and behind the neck. My reflection tells me I'm still not in a meet-the-mayor-of-echo condition. Oh, well. Let's get this train wreck over with. It's not so normal to see this room mostly empty. There's no old frail rat in Richmond's clothing. I've never spoken to our mayor, Mr. Testament, before, but frankly I never thought I would have to. The severe and formal-looking vixen who glared at me from behind half-moon spectacles I don't recognise. Dora, who sits on the couch parallel to them, calls out to me. Ah, there he is. Come here, Samuel, and please take a seat. She beams at the rat and the vixen, wearing her best smile. A drink, Mrs. Burns? I'd rather we had explanations to your employee, thank you. I scratch my head. I'm always happy to help in any manner. She meets her gaze with mine. You. You were at the Sheriff's Department last night. I blink. How'd she know? Then again, I suppose any of the three who brought Murdoch home could have explained the matter. Care to explain why my only son came home oozing blood at God knows what hour from a gunshot wound? I scratch my head again. We were just playing a friendly game of poker. And some kid shot us through the glass. I think the gunner was aiming at somebody else. Your son pushed him out of the way. The vixen's eyes narrowed. So what you're telling me is his injury was avoidable? Well, I suppose, but if he hadn't... I have no further questions. It sounds like what this young man did was very noble, wouldn't you agree, Sam? Oh, I suppose. I'll take an Earl Grey now, Tora. Since you offered. Oh, of course. Dora rings a porcelain handbell. Harlan appears, his face, face expressionless. Are you here, our guest? Black, a one sugar. A mayor, would you like a drink as well? I'm afraid I'm only thirsty for answers as well, my dear. Answers are not something you can drink. May I suggest a water with lemon? He gives her a tutty smile and shakes his head. Well, words. Dora laughs. Murdoch's mother doesn't. I just feel second-hand embarrassment. Uh, no, this is no day for niceties. He turns to me. A man named Huxley Green is missing. Now the union man, so there shan't be another upset, thank the stars. His eyes brightened at last, but while he pointed his finger at the ceiling. Then they darkened a bit again. But another disappearance may mark the actions of an insidious criminal. His beady eyes blink at me. Does William know about this yet? Sure does. Uh, not sure. Uh, why should I know? Well, surely William tells you all sorts of things. Such as? Perhaps problems with work or cases that he's uh, struggling with. Well, that sounds more like stuff like he'd tell his deputy. But it can't be just his deputy that he shares that with. Why can't it? Well, you know. Sometimes one ear isn't enough. Well, Todd has two of them. Was this rat sweating? This is our mayor. Aren't you William's boss? Well, yes, after a fashion. Can't you just ask him those questions yourself? Well, yes, I could. Yeah, I could. Harlan sets his silver platter in front of us on the coffee table. Well, sometimes it can be more useful to hear these things from other people. You don't know how Mr. Rattler can be like. I suppose so. The old rat looked over to the vixen with pleading eyes. Oh, Mrs. Burns, were there any more questions you needed to ask yourself? She took the teacup in her hand and sniffed it. Uh, no. She sipped silently at the cup. Dora claps her hands. Well then, that's that. My handyman has a very busy day ahead of him, as you do you all, so we shall not keep him. I don't need to be told twice it's time to go. 
That wasn't at all like I thought it would be. But I didn't want to be in that room a second longer. The mayor was hopeless, but I had a bad feeling about the old vixen. Almost like I'd said too much with barely saying much at all. How frustrating. What's that? You're leaving so soon again? Oh, it's not like I'm trying to sneak out. I just have to go talk to William again. She sighs. Hmm, what's wrong? You know I have to go. I know. That's not why I'm mad. So, what is it then? Is it because I'm not around so much during the day? She looks at me with some annoyance. I have other friends too, Sam. And yeah, I do miss you a little. But this is bigger than just some social insecurity. What is it then? Well, as of late, everyone in this town seems to think the invincible urban detective is going to solve all of our problems. They act as if a single criminal is at the heart of it all and that shooting them with a gun will make all the miners happy again. Or bring respectable jobs to the women here. Or that a native sheriff reflects a golden opportunity for Echo's Meseta. He's not even Meseta, Sam. His tribe is from the northeast. The stupidity is a butter churner, Samuel. And my brain is going solid. Well, I don't think any of those things, though. I know you don't. Like I said, it just reminds me of all the people who do when you have these private conferences with him. My voice whispers. He's helping me. She whispers back. But wouldn't the best way to help you be to keep his mouth closed? Well, I've got to go. Don't forget the shopping lit. I snatch out of her hand and make my way toward the back entrance. I decide to skip breakfast in the kitchens and make my way over to William's place. When I get to the sheriff's office, I knock on the door. I expect the gruff coyote to meet me. I just hear the cheerful voice of Todd instead. Oh my, it's Samuel. Come on in. I blink. The office is tidy as if the accident never even happened. Even the window looks like just like it did. I didn't expect to see you again this soon. By his scent, he probably wasn't planning on seeing anybody. Did you, uh, for chance forget to freshen up, Todd? Huh? You're a bit, well, ottery today. Oh. The otter titters nervously. Yeah, sorry about that. I can't abide a mess and that window needed fixing. Wait. Did you sleep, Todd? I napped. You can't be serious. I'm always serious. When it comes to things that matter, anyhow. Is the body still in the jail? I know, we took him to the coroner hours ago. To identify and officiate the body and all. Is that where William is right now? I know, he's at a pawn shop trying to trace the sale of the gun, I reckon. No, it's shop. I'm not sure, but we'll probably just get in the way if we intrude, intruded, so it's best to wait for him to get back. The otter stretches his arms and torso, yawning. But you can make it that long without dozing off. I'll hit my second wind, so I'll be sleepy, but I won't fall asleep. You keep a lot of odd hours? I'm not as odd as yours, I suspect. Fair enough. Though I'm usually done with everything by ten and up at six. That's much more ordinary than I'd have figured. Sometimes there are extraordinary situations, but that's just the gist of it. That's just another job. Sure, but it's hard to think about how somebody gets into work like that. Sometimes it's just a matter of looking at something and somebody looking back. Not so different from how you're looking at that cliff fella yesterday. Huh? Oh. You're thinking about him. And not so much about him. Or how what he's like. How do you mean? Well, he's fancy, but he still wears a man's clothes and sounds like a man. But sometimes he acts like how I think a pretty lady would act. It made me confused about how to treat him. But instead of just him, it started making me confused about how to treat everybody. Why is that? Well, my mama always said the most important thing is to treat a lady right, but also wound a man's dignity to treat him like he's soft. But how do you treat a man who acts like a lady at times? It would be wrong not to recognise he's soft, wouldn't it? I... I guess. Where exactly is all this going? 
I was just thinking you must have met all sorts of people like that Cliff fellow. I have never met anybody like Cliff. I mean all sorts of people who don't act like how you'd assume they should act. Like how everybody says we're supposed to act. You must know all about people in ways I'll probably never know. Like, well, like bodies for one. I'd certainly feel real bad if I didn't know much about bodies by now. Such as everybody's bodies really much different from one another? I'd say so. Though I guess there are lots of similarities if you think about it. Cocks and clits look pretty much like the same thing, one's just bigger. And they both swell up and both can squirt. That artery smell is a lot stronger now. I think Todd's aroused, but he probably doesn't even realise it. Never thought I'd have a conversation like this with him. Well, I'm sure I don't have to explain the squirting. Do you like pleasing ladies too, then? I'm not sure how to answer a question like that. Well, I don't hate it. It's like feeling their things, it's just another job. Aren't the men just jobs too? You don't have to put it like that. Sure. But they feel different and smell different. And when I please a man, something different happens to my body. There's a sickening sort of rush that makes me come harder. I have less control over it. And it feels really good in a way that other things never can be. The otter nods. His paw is on his lap and he's squeezing it. This has been interesting, Sam. I have a lot to think about. I can tell. Todd looks away. Uh, please don't tell nobody. I'm not in the position to, even if I wanted. The otter lets out a sigh. Oh, thank you. The otter tapped his webby paws on his lap. Yeah, I'll be back in a jiffy. I have to go take care of something upstairs. Uh, take your time. I appreciate that. He's up there for a while. When he finally comes down, he brings, brings a bunch of items to freshen up the room. Todd lights a few sticks of incense in the room to freshen it up. Though considering the strength of William's nose, that it'll do much good. We don't hear the front doorknob in the hall jiggle for a while. I smell William's familiar peppery canine smell before I see him. Oh god, you're right here. He looks distracted suddenly. Then he sniffs the air. Todd, what the? Hmm? Why does my office smell like a shrine? Ah. The new windows smell queer, so I thought some incense could help. William smells the air again. He squints. Well, I'll talk about this later. I found out who brought the gun. You did? Like I said, I didn't think it would be difficult to trace. Huxley Green brought that gun on the day he assaulted Mr. Tippett's. So that's why the target was Cliff. I knew that fucker was hateful. This is an excessive amount of spite for fellow he'd met in the day and also beat the shit out of. Then he disappeared without telling nobody? Maybe he hopped a train so he could lie low until things brushed over? Oh, it's a possibility. We don't know enough to speculate. I think it's time we paid Mrs. Green a visit. Should I stay here? I feel more comfortable if you came along. Huh? An extra pair of eyes is always helpful. Frankly, seeing more of what I see every day would do you good for the matters we have previously discussed. Have an island, boys. Let's go. Todd grabbed his vest from the coat rack while William and I head for the door. The three of us walk together. Some folks wave. Others turn their gazes. Marcy Green lives in a community of clustered log cottages in the middle of town. I remember how the smell of burnt sugar and butter used to tempt passing townsfolk to stick around for a little while. A year ago, Mrs Green's front window always used to stay open. Except her husband didn't like that so much, so she dropped the habit. But it's hard for old habits to die, ain't it? Strange. That window is open again. The heavenly scent of cinnamon, butter and huckleberries tickles my nose. Hello, hello? A girlish chirp comes from the window and I see something shuffling around inside. Oh, Mr Bronson, you brought Mr Rattler for a visit and someone new as well. The rat that greets us at the door is plump and pretty, but her outfit is difficult not to stare at. It's a bright red dress, but made entirely out of yarn, with mismatched buttons on the wide straps. 
It's like a dress you could easily picture on a child. Or a doll. The effect is peculiar on a grown woman. You look happy, Marcy. All right, it's raindrops. Come in, come in. You boys must be starving. William leads the way inside, following the plump little rats humming. The inside of her cottage is much larger than I had thought for just her and her husband living alone. The table seats six. The first thing I can think of about this house is too many knitted things. Potted succulents sit in the centre of the table with a cosy wrapped around them. The placemats are knitted too. Thankfully the plates are not. I'll be back with a slice of warm pie for each of you in a jiffy. Oh, I don't need nothing. She's already hustling into the other room. I finish my breath and take a look around me. The couch against the window is covered in so many knitted dolls I don't think there's enough room for sitting. Todd looks at me and follows my gaze. Huh. I was going there yesterday. William looks too. There's more than a countable number of crude dollies with embroidered mouths and button eyes. I flinch as I see a spatula flop a runny slice of pie on the plate in front of me. Oh, it's rude to stay, you know. My dollies are shy. I give William an uneasy look. He doesn't look back. Oh, Todd tells me these weren't here before. He leans in, speaks softer and gives a smile. Oh, I gave him the courage to come out. After she put a piece of pie on each plate, she carefully put the dish down on the cosy and took a seat, sitting up straight and setting her paws in her lap. Well, truth be told, I'm too simple to make anything pretty. But I don't think you have to be pretty to be loved. And I love these dollies very much. Some girls at the schoolyard were nice enough to show me how to make them, but I still have to practice. Are you hiding them? She giggles again. <laughs> uh, maybe. My eyes and ears register what's going on around me, but I'm not sure my mind can yet. I'm going back to the things you love, Marcy. Do you have any suspicions about where your husband might be? Her smile went away and her eyes widened, then looked away as if trying to recall something. Well, he usually turns up at that awful saloon drinking all of that poison. Sometimes it takes a while for him to get back, but he always comes back. She laughs. It's just never been three days before. Her glance switches sides. I used to be bossy about not letting him go there. But I've been good for a whole year. She looks back at William, shaking her head. No, I don't tell him what to do any more. He's nicer when he gets what he wants. She leans in and whispers. But isn't everyone? My gaze wanders back to the walls and I catch something I hadn't seen before. There's a quilted blanket tacked to the wall. I thought it just had strange colours at first. The texture on parts of it is different. Like half of it is covered in mould. Oh, I know Grandmama sure isn't pretty anymore either. I turn to see her looking right at me. Huh? Well, our friend's just curious, ma'am. Don't let his looks distract you. She's smiling ear to ear. Oh, the way it sags reminds me of Mama's smile. Sometimes she has to smile for me when things aren't so good. Her smile goes away and she pouts her lips. She looks above us, moving her head in a circular pattern, like she's looking at an invisible fly, and she looks back at us. Oh, it's fun to arrange things in the house how I want them. But I think I've had my fun. Enough fun for a while. She put her fork down and started to tap her wrist against the table. When do you think he's coming back? Todd stopped eating his pie. Oh, I don't know, Marcy. We might have to look for him. Or was he going to the saloon last time he saw him? She stared at nobody in particular. Well, that's what he said. But he had already went in the morning. He never comes back and then goes to the saloon again. He always stayed as long as he could. But that's what he did that day. So why do you think he really went? Oh, sometimes he'd threaten to take a train and leave me all alone if I wasn't good. Sometimes I thought this would be swell. Because it might mean I could share my pies how I'd like and play with my toys for as long as much as I wanted. But I never, never said that to him. So I don't think he took the train. But sooner or later he'd always bring up walking those tracks. Maybe he wanted a model train. 
Maybe he liked his toys too, but he just didn't want to tell me about it. My fork goes down. As good as the pie smells, I can't find my appetite. William stands, his plate entirely finished. Oh, thank you for your cooperation, Mrs Green. Well, continue the search. She looks up and smiles at him, then her gaze drifts away again. It doesn't seem like she can fixate on anything or anybody. Todd, watching William stand up, starts scarfing down the rest of his pie as fast as he can. I decide to force at least one bite. And it's the best pie I've ever tasted. We're far away enough from that house where I find the courage to speak again. The hell was all that? Well, Eid. They have a weak one. We'll scout the train tracks next. Are you sure that would be a productive use of time? Why wouldn't it be? I thought Mrs Green was being very helpful. Nothing about that all that made you feel uneasy? Oh, not too uneasy. I think Mrs Green is nice. Sure, Todd. I said it was a lead. When you have a lead, you try it. When it goes nowhere, you move on. We don't have the time to be dainty about these things. I hear something in the distance. It's mechanical sputtering. A shining automobile turns a street corner in front of us and begins to slow down. When the car reaches us, it slows to a stop. The glass window rolls down and the face of a ram smiles back. A Sheriff Adler, just the man I wanted to see. May I, my associates, don't have time for leisurely dalliances right now, Mr Hendricks. Before you rebuff me again, please consider an exchange of valuable information. I so desperately need your help. I can't find a man in your position wanting for anything. Desperate may be something of a hyperbole. But if you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You have nothing I need. And not even recent news of your ex-wife. William stops walking. That's a dangerous bluff to make with me. You're going to be real careful what you say next. I'd like to discuss it with you in the vehicle. If I go, my men go with me. Only that one. His eyes flick to me. Only one of my men isn't a driving. He can only watch one armed man. How does he know I'm not armed? A permission to scout ahead, sir. You must be talking about the railroad tracks. I'd rather you got some rest. I report back to the station tomorrow, deputy. Uh, yes, sir. The ram opens the back door of the car for us. Again in first, and Mr Hendricks follows, then William. Who oh, at you, sir? I just drive around the block. I'll let you know when to stop. The golden eyes of another wolf are watching me from the passenger seat. I look away. As I have told you before, William, there is an agenda against my livelihood. The ram pulls out a scroll of paper from his pocket. My secretary has compiled a list of uh, suspicious individuals. Though some oppose me in secret like the cowards that they are, others move openly. Many of the latter are jobless. They have nothing better to do than bite at my heels. I am certain you will discover many illegal activities if you comb through this list. You better not be bribing me with a check inside that roll of paper. Doing it to a sheriff, no less, could land you in a federal prison for years. A bribery? The ram lifts his chin and laughs. <laughs> a poppycock. It's merely a helpful list of suggestions, just to improve the uh, efficiency of your duties. I would hate for the town to think you were loafing around when we lack so much justice in this town. I'll stop the car. I see the driver's eyes meet the ram when he nods. The vehicle slows to a stop. I'm embarrassed for you, James. You really are entirely out of touch. Even the well-off folks are sitting around at home barely able to take care of themselves. Because there's no stable sense of community for families. The people in this town want order, not justice. But all has a funny way of unravelling here. Things seem peachy at first, sure. Then they go to hell in a handbasket in a blink of an eye. Because we just have clusters of unskilled, isolated strangers motivated by fear to survive. Your strangers. Your fear. 
And if that weren't the case, I don't think I'd be employed here. I know this town likes to pretend it's God's gift to the world. But it's a whole lot of nothing pretending to be something. I think deep down you know that. Something always fills the gap, James. It's not necessarily going to be you. If I may be frank, you're being incredibly dramatic. Am I? No man has brought more business to Echo than me. Our population grows substantially each month. We have a wonderful school, star attractions, desirable transit to up-and-coming major hubs, and natural wonders untapped for tourism. This town ain't World Fair material, James. You look like a damn clown in his honk and think about all the wagons. Mr Hendricks raises his voice. And machines like this will change the world. When paved highways span the nation, then everybody will come to us even faster than the trains allow. Ah, or my or is building every big city in the region. Echo is thr- a thrilling, exciting place to live. And anybody who cannot see that deserves no less than scorn and mockery. The only excitement these people get comes from the shit they put in their bodies. Oh, well. His eyes flick to me for a moment and back to James. Come on, Sam, we don't need to waste any more time here. He opens the door. Oh, wait. William's tawny tail is ready following out the door. Your wife arrived in town this morning. His wife? I see William spin on the ball of his left heel. What did you say? The coyote reaches for his belt and I feel James flinch beside me. The moon within the seats in front of me stay William's hand. She's at the hip right now. Shock and dread fill his face. Then a sense of urgency. He turns, bolting away from us fast I've ever seen him go. Wait, the list. He's gone. Mr Hendricks hoars out a sound remarkable frustration. Then he turns to me and the anger melts away. And now then... You seem like a boy with a good head on your shoulders. I sure don't hear that very much, but okay. Uh, Please, sir, take the list. Maybe you can drill into his thick skull that I may have helped him find that culprit. You sure haven't, unless I'm on that list. This is awkward. You don't listen to me either, but I'll see what I can do. Uh, Good on you, boy. Good on you. There's always a hope and a prayer. He slips the list into the front pocket of my shirt. Off you go. Uh, thank you, sir. I slide my fingers into the door handle and push. Huh? The door doesn't open. Uh, by the way, you don't agree with what that pig-headed idiot said, uh, do you? Uh, I'm not sure why you're asking me. Mr Adler and I are very important men, and we clearly have some passionate disagreances. But you offer an entirely different kind of perspective. So tickle my curiosity. Well, I think Echo's a goddamn hellhole. But in honesty, it's no better than the swamp I crawled out of. Seems to have some sort of mysterious appeal to folks like Dora and that fox and his family. The more I think about it, I wouldn't be surprised if both William and James are correct about some things. I can't tell what the future holds so I can't give an honest, straight answer about who I think is right. Ah, William's full of shit. The ram laughs. The big city's made him too pessimistic. I'm sure he'll see things my way, eventually. The ram leaned over and flicked a knob on my door. The door handle let me out this time. You see, he winks at me, I'm really quite nice, wouldn't you say? I exit quickly, but hopefully not too quickly. You said it. He weighs me off as his automobile rumbles to a start again. When the car is out of sight, I start running in the direction of the hip. I stop to catch my breath. Folks turn their heads when I enter, but I quickly lose interest. I see Harlan washing some mugs, so I approach him, still breathing hard. Have you seen the sheriff come through? Afraid not. I hear a loud sudden shout from upstairs. It's obvious who it belongs to. I look back at Harlan with some irritation, but he doesn't make an eye contact. Why did he lie to me? I move towards the stairs, but he grabs my shoulder. I don't go up there. More muffled yells boom from upstairs. A door slams open. William stomps down the stairs. 
Arlen's gaze follows him as the coyote shoves the saloon doors out of his way forcefully. I follow him outside. He's walking with a swagger and his tail is thrashing every which way. Somehow I get the feeling if called out, if I called out his name he wouldn't turn around. I don't even know if I want him to turn around. I don't think I've ever seen him in this kind of mood. So I walk with him at a distance. Until we're back at the station. He doesn't lock the door behind him. So I follow him back to his office. Both of his hands are on his desk. What's going on? The coyote looks up at me with a grimace on his face. My wife and my son follow me here is what's going on. His wife? His son? Why? I'm asking myself the same thing. If they wanted to leave the city, it would have been smarter to pick any other town. If they were followed, we're about to have a lot more problems. What do you mean, followed? Well, let's just say my prior position didn't leave me with the best of friends. It got so bad the government got involved. If we wanted to stay, we had to change our names. Well, I didn't, but my wife and son did. But coming here makes that whole ordeal pointless now. You think James brought them here? Maybe in part. He shifted his weight to another foot. She gave me a reason, but I don't know what to make of it. Well, what was it? The coyote exhales. She said she wanted to see me again. Huh. William had mentioned before they didn't think their current arrangement is close. Ain't that a good thing? You all had a son together. What's he like? I haven't seen him for seven years, Sam. He's a grown man and a stranger to me. I don't want to look at him. I don't want to look at her. They were just doing fine without me. What did they do to you? I don't want to talk about this with you. I can't help but roll my neck in frustration. Wait a minute. There's something not right about his posture now. He's lying to me. Okay. But who else you got? William. I asked what they did to you. He avoids my gaze. There's nothing wrong with them at all. He was a good, hard-working boy who got himself a job. And she was a dutiful wife. Always happy. Always kind. Seems like it was a lifetime ago. So why did it end? William squeezes his fists. Our world got torn apart. Dipped my nose too deep into trouble. Ruined a lot of powerful men. But that was only the beginning of the trouble. So we scattered. You must have really loved her to sacrifice that. He closed his eyes. No. That was the real problem. I didn't love her at all. What do you mean? Do I have to repeat myself? I never felt a damn thing. He smiles a lonely smile. I hated it. I know they both knew. But I wanted to give them a good life. And the harder I tried, he let a bitter laugh. The worse off we were. And the more I wanted to wrap my lips around the gun barrel. So today feels like my wedding day all over again. Oh, there's nothing here to drink. Jesus Christ. He's never talked this way before. Hey. What can I even say? William's gold eyes widen when I place my paw upon his neck. He exhales deep. He doesn't push me away. His pulse is absolutely thrumming. I start brushing his face. He doesn't stop me. We're very close now. I can taste sweet tobacco on his breath. He's the first to lick. William's never put his tongue in my mouth before. But it quickly retreats as if he burnt his tongue. I hate to imagine where that thing has been. You already know some of the places. I guess. His ears flick and he closes his eyes. He tastes me again. His grunts are happier that time. He releases another smack. 
So dirty, may as well be laughing come and eat an arse with you at this rate. I chuckle. So why don't you? Because I know I'd never like it as much as you do. Remains to be seen, Sheriff. He puts his big paw behind my head, drags it down to the table and sucks on my tongue. He whines a canine whistle and sucks on my tongue like he's trying to swallow it. Feels like at least a minute has passed before he breaks off the kiss, gasping for air and heaving. He stands up and wipes his mouth. I think he wants to say something. There's a soft knock at the door. William growls. What the hell is it going to be this time? He stalks toward the door in the hallway and opens it. Murdoch? The hell are you doing here? You should be in be here. You should be in bed. I'm sanitised, bandaged and full of medicine. We must discuss what we missed the opportunity for last night. To be continued. That was an interesting update. And yeah, so you get different responses to uh, those choices with William there. So if you have smoke room, you haven't done it, I recommend playing through the different options there just to see what happens. But the uh, next time will be uh, Nick's update, because I think the next patron one is uh, Murdoch. So uh, yeah, we'll be waiting for Nick, then William again. I hope you enjoyed this one, and any of you figure out what I feel about Hendrix by the way I play him? <laughs> Anyway, that is it uh, for now. Um, I think the next video is going to be another Minotaur Hotel. It's been a while since we played that one, so I should uh, get back into that. And hopefully with all the uh, other the, the ends now, we'll be playing them a bit more closer to the public release than we have for a while, just because things get busy. So until next time, and probably next weekend, have a good one. Bye for now.